what is the relationship between emotional EMF and Faraday's law? So we'll do a review next week. So because we're finishing today, we're going to do the whole week of review that I promised you. I didn't, I didn't really, when I promised you that, I thought I was totally lying. I thought there's no way we're going to pull that off. We're actually going to do it. It's amazing. All right. Here we go. Okay, so I do want to wrap up the photoelectric effect. Sort of the most important part at the end, we did really fast because we ran out of time. So I thought I would just say this end part again. Also, since you got it sort of basically in your head, it's going to make more sense this time. The, the end. And these energy diagrams are really important moving forward in physics. So we're going to draw a lot of those today. All right. Okay, so recall we had the photoelectric effect. It was this thing that showed a, a big step in modern physics that showed that light actually is a particle. Light is a quantized photon. Quantized just meaning it's a discrete particle. And we, they figured it out by having a battery on two electrodes, and you shine light on the electrodes. Well, oh no, I'm sorry. Light's a particle, right? You, you impinge photons upon the electrodes, right? And those photons give electrons energy and they jump off, right? And they go this way. But if you think of it in terms of energy, since we have a circuit here, that was the key. We said that, well, the energy of your electrons will be lower here and it'll be higher here because we've put a negative potential here. They don't want to go this way. And there's also a barrier to getting into the vacuum, kind of like that. So we drew the thing like this. Hopefully that kind of jogs your memory. And we said electrons are at all these different levels. We kind of draw them like a liquid because that matches sort of a standard description of them. The electrons fill up all these energy levels. Remember, this is energy. I think it was potential energy. This is like position, different parts of the circuit. Right? So all the electrons are here. This is just full of electrons. And this is full of electrons. And these energy diagrams, you can also think of gravitationally. Right? You don't have to look at them and think, oh my god, I don't know what to do. Just think of it as this is the ground. Gravity is pulling down, and this is water. Right? That's the standard analogy. So in this case, no current would flow, because the electrons can't get over the barrier. But we said the photons can give them energy, and it can knock an electron um, over the barrier. And if you wanted to represent that, really, on this diagram, you could even draw a line that's the length of the energy of the photon. Right, the photon is going to give all of its energy to uh, all of its energy to the electron. You could say, what if it gave it that much energy? Right, so there's HF. Remember, the energy of the photon was HF. So if you saw that, you would say, oh yeah, that's going to get over the barrier, and it'll go. The electron will go to here, and it'll gain some uh, some more kinetic as it goes downhill, and then the and current will flow. Current will flow right, that way. So the thing we were doing at the end is writing just a conservation of energy equation for this whole process of energy, right? We said that this thing is sitting here stable, light comes in, gives some electron, some energy, and let's, let's say, where does that energy go? So the photon is absorbed. Its energy goes into the system. But let's see where it goes. So we've got to look at this and remember some of these energies, I meant to draw this bigger, let me zoom in on it here. Zooming in uh, on this electrode. Here we go. So if we popped it up from down here, the electron was down here, and we gave it that much HF. Okay, so that's just a zoom in of that. Then this energy, uh, I think I was going to use dotted lines kind of like this. Right, this energy between where it was and the top of this, um, oh, no, I'm sorry, that's ED. Uh, this energy. <laughs> From the highest energy electron to the top, this is how much it takes to just get any electron out. This was E naught. Right, that was the work function. Okay, so E naught was there. That's part of it. Uh, this was E D. That thing I made up that's not in the book, just to explain this uh, more clearly. That's kind of how deep the electron was down in energy. The one that we happened to grab with a photon. Okay. So we got to add these two. But then there's a little bit more. Right. What is this? This is the extra energy the photon gave it. It must end up as kinetic. So we have sort of the ED, how deep it was. It has to get past the work function. And then whatever's left goes to kinetic. Right? So this is the photon energy. Energy. This is the work function. Remember, the work function is the least energy you have to give to get something out of the metal. Right? You can do more. But the highest level electron will pop out at the work function. This is how deep 
it was in energy, the one that you got out, right? And this is kinetic energy. How much kinetic energy did it fly out with, right? So you look at that equation, you say, okay. Um, and then I, I said, let's think about when you have the maximum kinetic. And I kind of explained it, and I got a text question, and I never answered it, and I'm sorry, but when are you going to get the maximum kinetic? Max kinetic. Well, let's look at this. This light, this photon, could pop out an electron from anywhere in here. So you can see you're going to get the maximum kinetic when you're popping out the electron from the very top. Right? So I'll actually draw that. When the maximum kinetic, I'll draw it on this side, would be here. Right? And then the photon's energy will be there. And then look how much bigger the kinetic will be. Right? The kinetic energy is how much above the barrier. So just by moving this up, but we can only move it up to here because there's no electrons in here. Right? The electrons are just in here. So what that's saying is just make ED zero. Don't waste energy by pulling out an electron in the bottom. Let's say let's pull an electron out of the top. Now you don't really get to choose, but we're saying what is the case that gives you the maximum kinetic energy? So then the balance would be the same, it's just we set this equal to zero. All of the photon's energy has to go to get it out of the metal. Right? That's, that's got to be there, that's the work function. But then everything else can go to kinetic, plus k. All right. All right, so we'll write subscripts one more time, so this will make sense later in two weeks when you're studying. All the photon's energy has to escape the metal to get the most kinetic. That would be the condition that would give you the most kinetic energy. Boom. Okay, that's what that equation means. And we're obsessing with this because this is what Einstein said to do. So if Einstein said this, then we do it. We don't ask questions. He had the crazy hair, and you know he's got memes and Apple commercials and stuff. So what higher authority is there? Okay. Now Einstein's experiment, though, had to do with a stopping potential. This is sort of the normal way you would think of this working. Okay, but remember. Uh, a stopping potential, what that meant is that you reverse the battery and you st uh, current still flows. You can still get current, which may sound strange. I mean, how can you change the battery and have the current still go the same way? The light is acting like a battery. It's almost like you have two batteries against each other and, you know, they're pushing and everything. Oh my God, I did not capture Daniel Coe's performance. Tear, oh well. The cameras are totally messed up. I'm gonna to try to get videos up. I know, it's like a disaster right now. Okay, so at the stopping potential, it looked like this. So let's remember, uh, we switched the battery. There was this IV, or no, this IV curve. We, as we varied V, yeah, it was an IV curve. Looked at I, it kind of looked like this. Well, I'm sorry, it's supposed to go up for a while and then lay over. But this is the stopping potential. This is an idea, you can reverse the battery, still get current. So let's draw the diagram and think, how could that possibly happen? But the reason it can happen is, notice that once this electron's over the barrier, it's just gonna go, it doesn't really need this drop, right? I mean, this is gonna drive it faster and give it more energy from the battery. But really the key is getting the electron over the barrier. You don't necessarily have to have the barrier shaped that way. So let's draw what the barrier looks like. If you reverse the bias, then it looks like this. Right? High energy, low energy. Low potential, high potential. We've switched everything around. Right? Same thing here. You got some electrons here, some electrons here. Right? Like that. Now, could you possibly get current to go again? And the answer is yeah. You just got to say, I'll grab an electron here from the very top, and I'll make sure the photon has that much energy, enough to get it over the barrier. See, now the barrier's on this side. So in addition to pushing against the work function, you have to push against the field the battery makes. So you've got two things to push against. Okay. So what was I going to say about that? So, so again, then this is the work function energy here. Uh, this whole thing is HF again. The line is the photon's energy. It's got to go against the work function energy. And then just when it'll get over again, that's K max. All right? That's how much... Um, that's the most kinetic you can have, right? Because I drew it from the top of the little, uh, or I drew it right at the work function. I didn't grab an electron from way down in energy. I grabbed the highest energy electron I could get, gave it HF, E naught's there, therefore that's the most kinetic you can get, okay? So we can write our equation again, and, except, oh, I'm sorry, so this K max here, 
we're going to use it all up to get over the barrier because it's the same as the barrier. V stop, all right? The voltage that you're turning at negative, the, the, big, the, the voltage that will stop all the current is the one right where this barrier height equals that kinetic energy. Okay, right, so if it's a little lower, they're not gonna get over more, you'll get plenty over. So this is the critical limit, is where V stop equals the kinetic energy. How can a voltage equal an energy? You put an E here, right? It's the energy of an electron at that voltage has to equal K max. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that same equation and say HF equals E naught plus K max. That's what's happening here, right? And we're gonna say, but the K max is actually equal to the, the negative voltage. You're basically measuring K max when you do this experiment. K max is being measured right there if you multiply it by an E. Okay, so we'd write it like this then. Um, HF, the electron's energy, I'm sorry, the photon dumps the energy that has to go to the, the, the work, work function to get it out. And then it has to also go to work against V stop. But we have to have an energy, so we put there. Okay, so just like here. Photon gives energy, you gotta escape the metal, and you get all that kinetic. Now, the photon gives it energy, you gotta escape the metal, and you gotta push all the way against the negative voltage. So that's all that is. Okay, we write that one more time. This is the photon energy. You must escape metal, escape, and you must use K max to push against the battery. That's what this term is saying. Oh, yes. Now, typical theorist would stop here and say, hey, everybody do this, and then post it on their blog, and people say, I don't know what that is. Experimentalists look at it and say, ah, you wrote E stop, but I don't know what you're talking about. So what you gotta do is you gotta take an equation like this and write it in a form that matches an experiment, right? And, and suggest an experiment. So Einstein said, let's write it like this for you experimentalists, this will make a little more sense. Let's solve it for V stop, right? So we're gonna say V stop is HF minus E naught. H, that's the free energy of the photon minus the work function, and let's divide it by that little e. All right, I'll take the e over there. There's your equation for e stop. But there's one more thing that we have uh, from the, uh, the, uh, the photoelectric effect. It's really a measure of the work function. The minimum frequency that'll get you any signal, get you over the barrier is the work function, if you have like no barrier. So, uh, F naught is the minimum frequency photon to get an electron out. That's the idea. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say there's an F naught you can measure here. And what he said to do is measure V stop as a function of F naught. All right, let's image mute, image mute. Yeah, let's see. So that's how we got to this equation that's actually useful for experimentalists. And we say, well, if this E naught, if F naught corresponds to E naught, you just need an H in there. It's like the photon. E naught equals H F naught. So if you have H F naught here, then you can pull the H and the E out. And that's how we got to his equation where he told the experimentalists what to do. H over E F minus F naught. And then you tell the dumb experimentalists, yeah, do that. Measure that and send me the blind. Don't think about it, just measure it. That's how we're treated. So the experimentalist measured it. Oh, Millikan, I guess he was kind of smart. Let's see, so he plotted uh, V stop uh, for different frequencies of light and got this, right? And it matches that. And the offset, uh, uh, the slope tells you H over E. Which as I said last time when we went through this quicker, that's important because that's the slope of the graph you measure will be in, uh, will equal the ratio of two fundamental constants. Planck's constant and the charge of the electron. So that was a way to measure Planck's constant and agree with other measurements of Planck's constant, et cetera. Here's F naught, that's the work function of the metal, essentially, right? That's the minimum frequency it takes to get an electron out if the barrier is really low, okay? So that was just a little bit more careful on the end that I meant to cover uh, last time, okay? Let's answer these 
and get on with our lives. Here we go. I'm sure these are all about the exam. Here we go. Uh, does the work function FC an energy of how deep the la, 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 does the work function an energy of how deep this have the same symbol? Uh, the work function is E naught, so I'm not sure. Uh, an energy of how do no that's E naught and E D, so that's E zero and E D is the depth. That's E D is also the one I kind of made up for this derivation. I don't they don't call it E D in the book. They just pull a little razzle dazzle on you. What's the difference between the lines for K max and E B stuff? That's the key. They're the same. That's the idea. Right? These are the same thing. If you're at the mid, if you know, that's what this thing is doing. It's pushing so hard, it's killing all the kinetic energy. So that's why those two are the same. That's why we equated them in the equation there. All right, so we're doing good. What is little e? Little e is the charge of the, is a, the elementary charge unit. So it's a 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. It's a charge of an electron, and it's a charge of a proton, just negative and positive. So if I want the energy of an electron at some potential, I just multiply it by e, because u is charge times potential. Uh, which lines around your graph correspond to E naught, K max, and E B stop? Um, which lines? Oh, let's see. Yeah, this got a little small. Yeah, I don't know. Office hours. Let's see. So there's E naught, and this is at the bottom of this uh, trapezoid, and this is at the top of the trapezoid right there. Yeah. yeah I don't know. I think we're done with questions because uh, I'm not affecting answering them all. Is the x intercept F naught? Yes. Uh, how does E over E equals F? Now we're doing alphabet soup. I, don't, I can't do all that in my head. How does E over E equal F? Uh, e over E equals F, yeah, because that's the N. Uh, no. Yeah, I'm not sure what we mean. I'll ask that one later. Okay. Cool. So now we're all good with photoelectric effect. I did have that one question from that one exam. I, mean, I will post it. I didn't post it yet. You'll find that question from that exam really uses the photoelectric effect setup also, just to ask electrostatic questions, like the plate separation is, you know, a centimeter, and the battery is given 100 volts. What's the field? Right, so that, that's how we would use it as well. And you'll see the homeworks that I'm going to get up tonight. We'll do stuff like that. Okay? The other big modern physics topic on that test we don't talk about was basically all radioactive decay, because it's just a simple exponential decay equation is all it is. So, I mean, it's, you got, it's hard to understand. We're going to have to learn it. But ultimately, it's a very plug and chuggy kind of thing. So I want to try to get you to the plug and chug, because we'll use it the same way. Oh, uh, yeah, OK. We'll finish that later. We'll do it again some other time. I don't want to go back to it. OK, so let's talk about a new part of modern physics, uh, the nucleus. Ooh, look at that. The nucleus. Very Game of Thrones here. Uh, protons and neutrons at the center of the atom. Protons. And neutrons at the center of the atom. And you remember what an atom is. And just to know the lingo, protons and neutrons together are called nucleons. Oh my god. So if you see a reference to a nucleon, it just means the sum of the two of them, or one of them. It doesn't matter which one it is. So if we draw uh, one of these things, you know, we drew it before when we talked about charge, I think. Say two protons, two neutrons, two electrons going around, and you chemistry masters may know what atom that is. That is, okay, maybe not, okay. Oh, man. If you didn't know lithium, I thought you might know helium, or you're just shy. It's okay. So how big is the atom? And by that, that's the question is, what do you mean? How big are the electron orbitals in the atom? Order of magnitude. You know, how big is this? All right. Useful things to know. It's about 10 to the minus 10 meters, or uh, also known as an angstrom. But then the question is, how big is the nucleus? Well, it looks like it's about half the size of the atom, the way I drew it here. <laughs> but it's not, right? It's much smaller. So the nucleus is a teeny little speck in the middle of the atom, 10 to the minus 14 meters. Okay? So in terms of volume, the atom is, you know, all electron density in a teeny little speck of nucleus in the middle. The densities that you and I know and love are all based on, you know, the electron density. If you actually calculate the density of the nucleus in kilograms per meter cubed or compared to water, then you know it's thousands of times higher. So nuclei are extremely dense. Okay? So now there's not, you know, in here, we did lots of thinking related to fields and stuff we've learned about. There's not as much stuff we can do here. Okay? We're going straight into nuclear physics where everything else, where everything is different. 
Somebody asked, how do they measure this? That would be the PBS historical series of modern physics. We're doing the one week, what you need to know for the MCAT. So I can't tell you how they measured it. It would be lots of stories and people shining rays at things and stuff bouncing back and cats and all this bullshit. So, okay, we're not going to do that. But one little uh, electrostatic calculation we can do is ask ourselves, ask ourselves, how can you get these two positive particles so close together in the nucleus? Okay, the answer is nuclear physics, but let's just calculate how, how hard it would seem. Okay, so how much work would you have to do? This is like a little example problem. Uh, would you do to get two protons within uh, one femtometer, which is about the size, uh, 10 to the minus 14, I'm sorry, 10 femtometers. Let's just say 10 to the minus 14 meters. All right, if we wanted to get them on the opposite sides of a nucleus, what would it take? So mm, hopefully you run to your equation sheet and say, oh, I don't know. Um, this is a little bit uh, of a, a kind of problem we didn't do. We didn't do problems where we said, here's an arrangement of charges. Tell us the total energy. So that's why I didn't ask it that way. I said, how much work would you have to do to get it that arrangement? Which is really asking the same thing, but just in a way that you guys are like responsible for, I guess I would say. So the way you would do this is you'd say, put one at, uh, at, at the origin, put one P at the origin, right? So there's a proton, and the other one at infinity, and here's your other proton, and you just have to push it there, right? And you push it all the way to within 10 to the minus 14 meters. Right? So it's just how much work does that take? Well, you'd want to know it's the potential. So you'd want to say you're basically talking about the potential difference between here and here, and to get energy, U, you just multiply the charge times the delta V. So we'd say, okay, well, what is the energy, the potential energy of this is the same as the work it took to push it there. So I'd say U is the charge of this thing that we're bringing across this delta V from infinity to here is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. That's that E. See why I wrote it as E before? So that's a pain right there. Um, uh, okay, I'm not answering off-topic questions. Uh, Q, and then how, what is delta V now? If we move from infinity and get kind of close to a point charge, this is where you got to know what the equations mean on the formula sheet, right? So which equation are we going to use? Uh, we're going to use the potential of a point charge was that simple one if everything's spherically symmetric, and it is because it's just a point charge, kq over r, right? So the delta V from infinity to here is k, 9 times 10 to the 9, q, now it's the q of this one, but they're both protons, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs over R, not R squared, it's energy, so it's just R, and that's the separation, 10 to the minus 14 meters. So you can see lots of crazy numbers. We got 10 to the minus 38 up top, but then 10 to the 9 drops it to 10 to the minus 29, and then we got a 14 coming up, blah, blah, blah. It's all weird, and it gets down to this equals 46 times 10 to the minus 15 uh, joules. You can check my math later. Right? So you say, okay, well, yeah, it's small because it's just a proton. But that's actually quite a bit of energy because we're talking about one nucleus. We're not talking about a big bottle of helium. How much energy did it take to shove all its nuclei together? I'm talking one nucleus is already up to an exponent that we have a name for, a femtojoule. Yeah, femtojoule. Right. So then you could say, well, what would it be? Here would be a fun question. If you had a one liter bottle and we had done some uh, chemistry or some uh, gas phase physical chemistry, you would have a 0.27 times 10 to the 23rd uh, nuclei. And then you'd say the energy that it took to ram all those together is uh, that would be 12 times 10 to the 8 joules. Right. I just took the energy for one and multiplied it by how many nuclei. This is more what we're interested in you being able to do. But just to show you, what is that? That's like a one gigajoule. So there's a lot of energy in the nucleus, sort of. Or it takes a lot of energy to assemble a nucleus. Okay? This is not a way to calculate the amount of nuclear energy available. Okay, that's a much more complicated thing that we're about to talk a little bit about what holds things together. I'm just giving you an idea that the idea of shoving two electrons that close together is a little bit crazy. Right? How could you possibly do that? And the answer 
is, oh, the drama, let's see, is the neutrons, or not the neutrons, is the nuclear force. All right. So let's see what's the answer. Uh, oh, we're on page four. <laughs> um, how does this nucleus stay together? The nucleus is held together by, and when they were getting started, I mean, what did they, they don't know what it is. So they said, well, it must be the strong, it must be strong, and it's in the nuclear, it's in the nuclear, in the nucleus, the strong nuclear force. That's how it got its name. It's strong and it's in the nucleus. Very specific. If they really understood it, it'd be named after somebody by now, but no. What does F indicate on the line? It always indicates force. I'm not even going to look. F is the force. Yes, thank you. That's the force it would take to push the protons together, but we calculated the energy. Um, is that technically just the energy of two protons when they are 10 minus 14 meters apart? Yes, that's what we were calculating. That was a question. OK. OK, so the nucleus is held together by the strong nuclear force between uh, nucleons. All right, so any two nucleons are attracted by the strong nuclear force. Proton, 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 neutron, 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 whatever you want. So we can't really do the math of the strong nuclear force. It's not nearly as simple as just a little electric forces. But we can draw kind of the diagram to give you an idea. So, you know, this is what I want you to be able to be comfortable with a little bit, is an energy diagram. What's the potential energy of shoving two protons together? Shoving two protons together. That's that axis. The, the MKS unit of that is too close. Let's see, so zero here, right? So how do you shove them together? So the electric energy, the electrostatic, it gets really big, right? They don't want to be close together, so it's like this. Right? It goes as one over R, so we just calculated. We put them really close and we got a femtojoule. We got it like right there. So what pulls them apart is a strong nuclear force, right? So it says they do not want to be on top of each other. Quantum mechanics gets in the way. But then there's this big well here, right? They would like to be here. So it pulls them to within about a femtometer of each other. Right? So this is the electric force, electromagnetic, really. And this is the strong nuclear. Now notice I'm not plotting forces. I'm plotting energies. So that's just what physicists tend to do. We don't calculate everything as a force. We just draw an energy curve, and we know that the force is the derivative of the energy curve. So just get used to in chemistry, and if you do some other physics, you'll see lots of plots like this. Where we say, clearly, if we add these two, there's going to be a minimum here at a femtometer. So I've told you almost nothing technical about this. Right? The strong nuclear force is strong. You can see the energies are bigger. It overcomes the electric force. And it has a minimum and holds things at about a femtometer apart. And that's it. So if they get too far, if they start to go apart, it pulls them together. If they start to get too close together, it pushes them back. It does both. That's a very complicated force. So if it exists between two protons, why do you need neutrons? What are neutrons good for? So they're just there to help keep the balance. You know? So if you have, uh, so you'll notice, well, I didn't really draw it accurately enough, but the electric force is much more long range than the nuclear force. So if you had a, a bunch of protons alone in a nucleus, the ones far apart wouldn't have much strong force pulling them together, but they'd still have a big electrical force pushing them apart. So the neutrons are in there to kind of keep the balance and hold the whole thing together. So that's why there's neutrons. But we don't need to get into the math of that. I want us to get to decay. OK, so basically then, so the, uh, so the nucleus holds together, but is not entirely stable, uh, depending on the arrangement of n's and p's. Right? So there's a whole theory, and it's in the book. If you want to read about it, it's not in the sections I, I said for the exam, uh, called the shell theory. And it's kind of like the electrons in an atom. They're energy levels, and they occupy them, and they arrange certain ways. Same kind of deal. But it's just done by neutrons and protons and how they're arranged. So some nuclei, very stable. I don't know, hydrogen, very stable. Proton isn't going anywhere. But if you get a very large nucleus with lots of different parts, 
lots of uh, neutrons having to hold all that stuff together, it can fall apart pretty easily. Okay? So, so yeah, the second part. So the next half we'll do uh, what happens when the nucleus falls apart. Okay. So five minutes. I gotta see if I gotta defrog that. Yeah, you can't calculate that. On this top part is just this. Yeah. Okay, so when mm -hmm. they match, it's at one femtometer? When they what? When they match, it's like at one femtometer. Uh, the minimum of the strong nuclear energy is about one femtometer. Oh, gotcha. Thanks. Shit. 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 <laughs> You would have to understand the strong nuclear force. And I don't either, so I can't explain it.
Okay, let's keep going. I got some very inquisitive questions here. Let's see, excellent, difficult to answer questions. What's the difference between the electric and strong nuclear force? What are they? Yeah, so if you really want to know, you've got to be a physics major. Or you could maybe take the nuclear physics class. It's just got some math in it. So that would be the only way to find out. It's not something I can just casually say in two sentences. They are very different. You've heard of the four fundamental forces. Electromagnetic is one. Strong nuclear is one. So they're just different fundamental interactions in the universe. That's what they are. That's all I can say. Did you say force is just a derivative of energy? It's the negative derivative of energy. Yes. So does the atomic bomb utilize the energy stored in the nucleus, or would nuclear fusion theoretically utilize it? Yes. Yeah, so the little calculation I just did about electrostatics was just a fun calculation that we would have you do for a thought experiment. It has nothing to do with where nuclear energy comes from or how nuclear bombs work. For that, you've got to understand the whole nuclear structure. So I don't want to sit here and say some very general statement that would probably be in many ways be wrong. <laughs> so, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, sit here and just talk about nuclear energy because I don't know much about it. All right. Now, where were we? We were saying that the nucleus might be um, unstable because you've got all these neutrons and protons sort of barely being held together with a balance of the nuclear force. Um, and you may have heard of the, the dangerous, scary thing is you know, there might be radiation. Oh, no. We must fear radiation in all forms. Well, we better not, right? Because let's keep in mind, uh, radiation isn't always bad. It's anything, if you want to get technical, moving in a radial direction. Okay, so if you just say radiation, that's not bad. You've got to say what kind of radiation. For example, electromagnetic radiation is one we've talked about. All right, magnetic radiation. And that can be as friendly and simple as light. Visible light here, visible. I don't remember if we drew this. Um, we talked about light before, but light is radiation, visible light's radiation. So usually the word you put in front of radiation tells you whether you should be scared of it or not. Right? So if you go a little bit higher uh, energy, uh, I think of wavelength, oh dear, let's, uh, okay, let's go increasing energy here, UV, you've heard that UV radiation, kind of bad for you. Then you get up here, X-rays, kind of bad for you, you don't want too many, once a year in your teeth, whatever, and then gamma rays. Oh, horrible, except they're all showering down on you from the heavens, messing you up. But your body has defenses, so don't worry about it. You go this way. You've got IR radiation. That just warms you up. That's nice. And you've got uh, what's past the IR is microwave. That cooks your burrito. And you've got radio. That used to bring us music. It doesn't anymore. Okay. Now it's just for looking at black holes or something like that. Okay. <laughs> So if you just say electromagnetic radiation, it might be dangerous or it might not. You need to know where are we here, right? So then you would say UV radiation, oh, bad. X-ray radiation, bad. IR radiation, good. You just don't want too much. Catch on fire, okay? So there's lots of different kinds of radiation. Just the word radiation uh, does not mean something is bad. But let's look at the kind of radiation you get when radioactive material uh, decays and falls apart. Let's see. Uh, so a radioactive material, and that means basically a material with unstable nucleus. And so any material in principle, the nuclei could uh, uh, degrade or change their state and, and emit radiation. But of course, there's famous ones, uranium, plutonium, etc. So radioactive material emits three types of radiation. Three types of radiation, and it's useful to be somewhat familiar with them. So this is the one list I guess you have to memorize is the three types of radiation from radioactive material. I'm confident that you can do it. Okay, so if you had some radioactive material like this, here's a lump of radioactive material. Here it is. Oh, there's crap flying out of it. Oh, it's so dangerous. Okay, so we put it in this can like this. Here's a diagram from your book. And then it's okay, so now it's only getting out here. And then we put an aperture here like this made out of lead. So then you've got a beam, okay? Now we have a beam of whatever that radiation coming out of that thing is. See here, it can't get through the lead. There we go. So you do an experiment, something like that. All right. And then you would send the beam into a field like this. Ah, a magnetic field pointing into the board like that. 
and you'd find three different behaviors, okay? One thing would just go straight through, right? One thing would curl up, and one thing would curl down, like that. That's the first, the fundamental way they know there's three kinds, is they do three different things in a magnetic field. So you can maybe start to guess uh, what the property difference is. I'm going to let us think about it. They named them, again, very detailed, alpha, beta, gamma. We don't know what they are. Alpha, beta, gamma. Also Einstein's uh, fraternity, but that's just a major coincidence. Okay. They all have different charges. So maybe you can tell from this they have different charges. So let's see if we can figure out what their charges are. I remember they're moving. It's a beam moving. So think for yourself for a minute if we label them alpha, there's alpha, there's beta, and there's gamma. So what's the charge on an alpha particle? Is it positive, negative, or neutral? Okay, it's positive. Hopefully you got positive, right? It was moving along. It must be a force up like that. So V must have been this way from the experiment. V cross B up. Since it's a positive charge, the force is in the direction of the V cross B. So this is positive. Uh, therefore, the beta particle, you must know, would have to be negative. The only way a particle is going to move this way into a magnetic field that way and go down is if the negative charge is reversing the direction of the force. V cross B is up. Negative particle makes the force on that one go down. Betas are negative and gammas are neutral because they don't turn. They don't feel a force. V cross B can be whatever it wants, multiply it by zero, and that's all you get. And eventually uh, we figured out we, I wasn't involved actually, I wasn't born yet, but we, meaning physicists collectively, figured out what they are. So the alpha particles are uh, helium nuclei, basically. HE, they usually put a four here, meaning uh, four nucleons, two protons, two neutrons. But in chemistry, you'd also put like a plus, is it two plus or plus two? I haven't taken chemistry since 85. Two plus. Since it has no electrons, it's an ion, right? It's an ionized helium. So it's really just a helium nucleus flying around without any electrons on it. Cool. What is the electro, what is the beta? It's an electron. Right? An E with a little light, negative sign is sort of just a graffiti way to write electron. Okay. And then gamma is neutral. What do you think it might be? It's a photon. It's electromagnetic radiation. And gamma, it's a gamma ray. So it's the one way up here. Right. So sometimes nuclei emit gamma rays, maybe sometimes x-rays. It depends on the energy. Right. The energy in the nucleus is really high, so the photons that come out, and the, these all tend to be in sort of the mega EV, M EV range. Okay. So this is all due to the decay of an unstable nuclei. Okay, so let's see. So let's look at then what they do. What do they make happen here? So these particles, alpha, beta, and gamma, are roughly 10 to the 6, a million times the energy, times the uh, energy of visible light and uh, molecular bonds. So if you want to do your energy scales, if you're a chemist, you do your kilojoules per mole or whatever. In physics, you do it for a single atom or molecule, and you do it in EV. That's why we have EV. So typical photon has an EV, a, a visible light photon, one or two EV, three or four EV. A molecular bond, one or two EV, three or four EV. That's why we exist at this scale, because everything's stable, and you can have interactions, and light can do things, and our eyes can work. But when these things come in, they're at a, mega, a million EVs, right? So visible light, molecular bonds, roughly EV. These things are roughly a million EV. So as you can imagine, they have the potential, the ability to tear right through us, right? They just fly right through you. Um, uh, I guess, and I'll say, they break bonds. Uh, break bonds and ionize ordinary matter, especially if they're charged. All right, so especially a charged helium uh, ion hitting you will definitely ionize things. Electron will definitely ionize things. Photons tend to pass through a little bit more, but they still have other mechanisms where they can cause uh, damage. Okay, 
So how do we possibly survive with all these things flying through us all the time? Well, your body recognizes a mutation and puts it back together. So that's why sometimes they're called together collectively ionizing radiation. That's the big medical word, right? So I said that for radiation, you've got to be specific. What are you talking about? Should we be scared of like 2 EV electromagnetic radiation? No, that's just visible light. Should we be scared of all these individually? Maybe. It depends. But if they say ionizing radiation, that means it's one that as it goes through matter, it'll tear things up, right? So it looks kind of like this. If this is some matter, everybody's happy, you know, neutral molecules, everything's good, and a particle flies through, say, an alpha, then all the ones nearby become charged, right? Say so it rips all the electrons off, and it makes a little streak. And you can imagine if this was a delicate biochemical symbol uh, 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 system, then that would be bad. Right? You don't want big radicals created in all this. Okay? So they leave trails of ionized matter as they tear through. Of ionized matter. And um, they cause mutations. If we want to talk biological, you know, they cause mutations. That's why at the end we're going to talk about like the dosages and all that. Cause mutations, but you have natural defenses to, so we don't, so we can still survive. Right? So I'm going to show these to you. So this is called a uh, a bubble chamber. I think I am. I've never never set this up for a class before. Let's see. So, oh, I turned that off. I thought I was done with it. So let's look at a bubble chamber real quick. And you'll find that you don't have to be near. Um, a radioactive source to see these, there's particles flying through the universe all the time. From up high, from the sun, from the Big Bang, whatever you want to call it. Uh, let's see if we can see them. So there's a camera sitting on top of that thing. The projector is waking up, and you're going to be basically looking down into these bubbles. And it's basically, uh, it's, uh, it's ethanol, and it's super saturated ethanol vapor. So when the particles go through, they make ions, and they make big bubbles. Oh, turn off the image mute. Here we go. And the bubbles make like a streak. Right? So there, that cross, that's just a thing on the bottom of the plate to help you focus. And maybe you can see those little trails being created, shooting through. Right? Those are mostly electrons and muons flying through the room right now all the time. Look out. Don't get too close. Yeah, and you can see you can't avoid them. Right? Oh, look at that one. Oh, my God. Are you okay? Did that hit you? Are you okay? Okay. So that's just the natural background. We can also uh, look at the alpha particles coming off of a radioactive source. So let me go get it. It's just teeny. It's, it's from a smoke alarm. You're fine. It's, it's, it's in paper. OK, so the radiation coming from this thing can't get through paper. OK, so we're all fine. And it certainly can't get through the glass. It's totally fine. It'll be fine. No, it can't go through paper. It can't go through glass. I'm just going to dump it in there. And I think if I do, we'll be able to see the little alpha particles it creates. So you saw sort of the standard background glow of the universe. So let me dump this in. Oop. There it is. And once it calms down, you might be able to see little extra high density of uh, particles flying off of it. If I can get the camera back. There it is, that little thing. It'll need a second to calm down. So that's a teeny little thing that's in your smoke alarm that creates the ionization that your smoke alarm detects. And basically is how it works. So it's not dangerous. Don't take your smoke alarm apart, but we're professionals. So what that's supposed to be doing is uh, creating uh, streaks. And now you can see the background streaks are gone too. It's because the experiment's messed up. It has to calm down for a second. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that there and keep talking. And as soon as I think it's starting to make traces, we'll look again. And what we'll see is alpha particles coming off of that thing at a much higher density than we had just from the universe. Okay? What we need to talk about is exponential decay. Let's see. All right. Oh, there's some street. Oh, that's on the plate. Never mind. I thought it was warmed up. Okay. So now we're going to talk about is the mathematics of how the, the nucleus comes apart. This is the basic simple formula that you want to be familiar with. And of course, we're going to do our thing and talk about it in great detail and give you a very intuitive understanding of it, because that's what we do here. Let's see. All right. Let's see. We have streak shot. No, it's still calming down. Yeah, it takes it about 10 minutes or so once I mess with it. OK. 
So what we're going to look at now is simply exponential decay, not even specific to nuclei. All right, not even specific to nuclei. Let's talk about the idea of exponential decay and where it comes from and, and why do we call it that, okay? So just think of it this way. When a collection of objects um, each has the same chance of, of you know, let me get that word in a minute, each has the same chance of I think I put disappearing. Disappearing per unit time. So you don't have to think about them um, as a collective or anything. It's just you have a bunch of things, and they each, say, have a 10% chance of disappearing every second. So here they are. Here's a bunch of things right here. A bunch of circles. Okay? And imagine each of them might disappear every second. Each of them has a 5% chance of disappearing every second. That's the first number you need to know, okay? So we're gonna put this mathematically. Each has uh, a probability per unit time, uh, a probability per unit time equal to R. So R is just the rate, right? The probability per unit time R uh, of disappearing. Right, we're talking about disappearing, right? So, so this is just called the decay rate. You can imagine if each one had a 50% chance of disappearing every second, they'd disappear pretty fast. If it had a 0.01% chance of disappearing every second, it'd take a lot longer. So that's why it's a decay rate. Not even talking about all the particles yet, we're just talking about each one. But what we want to think about is uh, um, the rate at which they leave depends on the number, okay? So now if I want to think about the whole thing, this is about each one. Now for the collection, the rate they leave, that doesn't just depend on each one, that depends on how many you have, right? If I have one and it has a 10% chance of leaving per second, the chance of one leaving is 10%. If I have 10, the chance of one leaving is a little bit higher, right? Because all of them might leave every second. So the more you have, the larger the rate of them leaving. So if you have a collection, uh, the rate, uh, collection, I'm going to put an N here, so N is the number, then DN DT, all right, is minus r times n. So let's see if that all makes sense. The number of these as a function of time, or I'm sorry, the rate that these would disappear, well, it's going to be negative, because d and dt would be negative if they're disappearing. It's going to depend on r, and just take r times n, right? If one of them has a 10% chance of leaving, then four of them has a 40% chance of leaving, right? Just r times n. So then we have this equation. We have a differential equation. So now we just have to solve it. See, life is all differential equations. That's all there is to life. I've run out of, oh, it's not cold anymore. We can't do the hot source. Totally safe, but now the thing isn't cold anymore, so I'm just gonna take it to the back. We'll set it up Tuesday if you wanna look at it for funsies. Oh, well. I think I took a video of it, so I'll play it later. Okay, so, so this is our differential equation. Now we just have to solve it. Ah, yes. Let's see. We solved one by guessing, I recall, for oscillating motion. We solved that by guessing. This one we don't have to guess. Uh, this is kind of like the charge on a capacitor. I don't think we derived that. I think I just gave you the answer. Now we're going to derive it. Why is Rn negative? Because we're talking about decay. Because they're disappearing. So disappear is the negative sign. If they were appearing, it would be positive. But if it's D and DT and they're disappearing, that's negative. Okay, so we want to find the number in at all times. So basically, we're just saying solve for N of T, right? You have a differential equation defining how N of T varies. We can't just solve it for N of T because it's, the rate is here and the value is here, okay? So often in a description, of exponential decay, they'll just say, well, it's where the rate depends on the number present. So I'm just telling you why that happens, okay? Now it's just math, now we just solve this. So to solve this one, you do a thing where you put all the n's over here and all the t's over there. You just get the n's together, d n over n, and that's minus r dt, 
Okay. And then you integrate. So we have a dn here and a dt there. So you integrate both sides, and you integrate them for kind of the same experiment or the same process. So we're saying at t equals 0, um, n equals n naught. We're going to start at some initial amount of these nuclei, some initial amount of radioactive material. And after a certain time t, n is just going to become n of t. That's what we're solving for. Right, from n equals 0, from n naught to n of t, from 0 to t. Okay? So what is the derivative of dx over x? Natural log x. I'm just drive, you don't have to do this. I'm just deriving this for you. It might be helpful to know what's going on. But the natural log of n from uh, n0 to n of t. All right? Took the, the integral of that. It's natural log of n. Now we're going to evaluate it. This side, you can do this integral probably, minus rt, right? r is a constant, integral dt is t. rt evaluated from 0 to t. All right, let's evaluate it. Natural log of n of t minus natural log of n naught. So the natural log minus natural log is the natural log of the ratio. If you didn't know that, now you know. I just told you. n of t over n naught. That's this side. Minus r plug in t minus minus 0. And a plug of 0 in there is a 0. So it's just minus rt on the right. <clears throat> and then we want to solve this for n of t. So if you have something stuck in the natural log, you take the exponent of each side. And I like to write a big E like this. Oh, I just exponentiated each side. Cool. OK, what is E to the natural log of something? It's the something, n of t over n naught. And that's just still e to the minus rt. We can't do anything with that. e to the minus rt. Ah, now you can see it. This is how you derive exponential decay. That the number you have is a function of time. That's a function of time. I haven't been writing those all year. I'm just reminding you what we're deriving here. n is a function of time, is whatever you started with, e to the minus rt. e to the minus the decay rate times uh, time. Right. So let's look at what that looks like at standard exponential decay. Right. That's yeah. Let's look at it. Let's see what we can do with it. Uh, let's see. So there's the equation, n equals n naught e to the minus rt. We call that exponential decay. And you know what it looks like. You've probably seen it before. But if you haven't, we'll walk through the plot here. There's time. There's the number you have as a function of time. So we're talking about the number in this little collective here. It's going down because they're decaying. So at 0, what is it? So put a 0 here. What is e to the 0? 1. Anything to the 0 is 1. So it starts at n naught. Right, so we say it starts here at n naught, and just exponential decay. Put it in your calculator. It does that. All right, exponential decay. So this just says that the number goes down like that. It doesn't go down linear. It never gets to zero. That's weird. Why can it never get to zero? Well, if you have an infinite number of them, it'll never get to zero. If they're stacked like this, then eventually, yeah, that last one will go. But in the limit that there's an infinite, it never quite makes it to zero. Um, there's some fancy words we want to use here. So n equals n naught e, I'll just write it again, minus rt. So r, we defined before, was the decay rate. But in physics, we often like to invert a uh, variable and give it another name. Just, you know, sometimes people start to understand our discipline, and we say, oh, wait, we've got to slow them down. So let's give this two names and invert it. Right? So r is the decay rate, tau is uh, the uh, lifetime. So usually, you might hear it described as the lifetime rather than the decay rate. It's just like for the capacitor, right? It had tau or it had RC, right? And tau was 1 over RC. Same thing, right? So let's see. Now, this is not specific to radioactive decay. So one thing we love to do in physics is that you have uh, one equation that describes many phenomena, OK? And the most interesting exponential decay, that has ethanol in it. Let's see. Uh, the most interesting exponential decay is the head of a beer. Have you all seen this paper? 
There's a new paper where basically if you take beer and you pour it in a thing and you make like the head, what is the head made of? Bubbles. Why is it so big? Because the bubbles take up volume. All right, the bubbles take up volume. Uh, what happens to the bubbles in time? They pop. Do they each have the same chance of popping every second? Yeah, basically. So you basically, your bubbles are a collection of objects that each has the same chance of popping. And when they pop, their volume goes away. So what people have studied very carefully is if you look at the, the volume of the thing here, is that it goes down very fast at first and it slows down because it's exponential decay. And what's convenient about a cylindrical uh, thing like this is that the volume is what you're calculating, but the length, uh, the, the length is proportional to the volume. So a constant cross-sectional area. So we're going to try to do, I meant to put on the camera here. I'll come over here and put on the camera. Oh, no, the screen's gone. Is you're going to try to watch uh, the bottom of the thing here. And first, we'll just get it going and get some in there and make a whatever. And let's see here. Oh, you've got to watch both at the same time. So you see here, it's going real fast. Right, you can actually see it moving, but in time it'll slow down. Now it's still moving. So people have timed it and made a video, and you just watch the top and the bottom, and you just watch the height change, and it's actually exponential decay. I wanted it to be faster. Okay? <laughs> so that first it went that far, you know, in like 10 seconds. I did practice this morning, which explains the lecture a little bit, you know. It went that far in 10 seconds, right? Now in 10 seconds. 10, oh, it, went, it didn't go as far, did it, in 10 seconds. Right. So watch this, do this on your own, okay? If you're over 21. If you're not, just do it and get somebody else to drink it, right? <laughs> 10 seconds later, less. So you can see it is slowing down. So if you track it, it's pretty close to exponential decay uh, at the beginning. Right. Okay, well, let's finish the lecture, okay. I want to break two rules at once. You're not supposed to drink from lab glassware, right? Mmm, yes. <laughs> I cleaned it myself, so it's fine. Okay. So. It's true for beer, it's true for everything, okay? Okay, so there's one more number that we gotta know. Is you would think this would be good, right? You would just calculate R and you would calculate tau, and that's how you would calculate everything. But, uh, no, people have to be more complicated than that, right? So let's draw the one we really have to calculate here that people talk about. You've heard of it, there's a violent video game, I think, that's called this is uh, the half-life. Yes, I've been said to be living it. Uh, radioactivity is often characterized by, often characterized by the half-life. All this is is another way to write tau, all right? There we go, I cleaned it myself, it's fine. There's a little acetonitrile I still, I can taste some acetonitrile, but it doesn't. <laughs> right? So it's the time from n naught to one half n naught. So it's really just the same plot. Here's graphically what the half life is n naught, one half n naught. So it's literally just this time right here tau, uh, tau one half. Okay? Tau is around here. Right? Tau is when you get to 1 over e, if you do the math. Tau and half, the half-life is just to get to a half. So it's not really anything fancy at all. All we've got to do is say, well, we know it's n as a function of time is n naught uh, e to the minus uh, 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 t over tau. Right? So we, how do we get to half of n n naught? Oh, we put a half n naught. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, like that. Uh, what do we do now? Let me pull in my notes. Oh, yeah. We take the natural log of both sides. Natural log of one half. All right, the n not canceled because we're talking about a relative amount here. And that's the natural log of that is minus t over tau. Oh, and t one half. I'm sorry. This is supposed to be minus t the half life over tau, the uh, lifetime, one half. All right. So now let's turn around. You're going to say, wait, how can the half life be negative? Does that mean it's growing? What is the natural log of one half? Oh, it's negative. Yes, the math works out. And you find that the half life equals the negative natural log of one half, because the natural log of one half is going to be negative, times tau, the lifetime, which is one over r. Okay? So to be extra annoying, we have three ways to talk about this time constant. 
There's the decay rate, there's the lifetime, and then there's the half-life. And they're all giving you uh, the exact same information. There's nothing different about them. Okay? So those are three numbers for the lifetime. So in problems, you can imagine what we're going to do. Now you have the half-life. How much is left after this amount of time? Here's a problem where we give you the decay rate. How much is left after this much time? Right? You just got to know how to transfer between these three things and plug them into the decay equation. That's really what the problems are about. But I'm going to put up that you'll have lots of practice doing and on the MCAT. There were 15 problems in that practice MCAT I did on, radio, on radioactive decay. But it's, it's really just plugging into that equation. They're really not that, that hard. Okay? But I thought it would be good to practice them. But the last thing is the amount of radioactivity. Right? So we've done the time now, but in not, how much is there? I just want to tell you kind of the units that they use to characterize that, just so you'll be familiar with this terminology, and we may use it as well in our problems. Um, okay, so the amount, amount of radioactivity um, depends on the number of nuclei, as you can imagine, and how unstable they are. The number of nuclei um, and how unstable. So you don't really characterize it just based around the raw number, right? So if you had an equal number of carbon atoms and an equal number of uranium atoms, the uranium would be a lot more radioactive than the carbon because it's a lot less stable of a nucleus. What you really characterize it by, based on is how much stuff is coming off of it. So the activity is the uh, word. Because the thing is called radioactivity, so the activity is the amount of radioactivity. And it's just called big R. And it's just the number, uh, uh, number of decays per second. OK? So if I have a radioactive sample, it's got particles coming off. How many come off per second? That's the activity. In terms of numbers, we've already said R equals R times big N. Right? It's, we used this in the formula before. The number of decays per second is what's the chance of each one decaying per second, and how many are there? Right? But this is the number we tend to use. In NK, MKS units, it would be in inverse seconds. But in MKS, it has a fancy name, MKS. Um, it's in BQs, Becquerels. I forgot how to say it. It's the guy's name. Right? So a BQ is really just a 1 over a second, inverse second. Okay. So if you have a sample and you want to know how radioactive it is, you'd be given a number, number of uh, particles uh, coming off per unit time. How dangerous it is, of course, depends on what those particles are and how much energy they have. Right? This is just a count. It's not getting into, is it that many BQs of alpha particles at 100 EV, or is it that many BQs of beta at a giga EV? I would want to know the difference. The other famous uh, unit is in Curie's, uh, CI. And that's a lot, because those were developed uh, for, with radium, <laughs> unfortunately, is 3.7 times 10 to the 10 right, uh, decay per second. So we might give you a problem for fun. In Curie, you just got to convert it to, Becker, to BIs. Okay? So Curie was the amount of radiation coming off of a gram of radium. So that's why it's so high. Okay. So that's really it, right? So if we told you you had a certain amount of material with a certain number of nuclei, you could calculate big R, and you calculate the time constant, calculate all these things. There was one other thing I was going to say, but I forgot what it was. Oh, we're out of time anyway. Okay, so next week we really will review, I promise. <coughs>